Jensen, thank you so much for, for being here today. And I want to get started just with a question that is really basic, but I think chips have been in the ecosystem a lot more lately, and there's mm -hmm. people who probably didn't even really know what mm -hmm. a semiconductor was mm -hmm. a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Can you give me a very basic definition of what NVIDIA is? Wow, that's an easy question. Well, we are a technology company that uh, processes software for applications and domains of science that are barely possible without us. And so because of what we do, we can make what is barely possible possible or we can make something that is very energy consuming, very energy efficient, or we could turn something that costs a lot of money and make it much more affordable. And so we created this thing called accelerated computing. And that was what we pioneered about three decades ago. And it's taken until now to really take off. In the early days at Denny's with Chris and yeah, Curtis, yeah. the dream was probably simpler. Uh, yeah. Can you explain what it, what it, what your first dream was, what the vision was, um, even though now it's come so far to be this accelerated computing company? Well, at the time, if you go back 30 years, at the time the PC revolution was just starting, the microprocessor was starting to take off, the CPU was starting to take off, and there was quite a bit of debate about what is the future of computing and how should software be run. And there was a large camp. And, and rightfully so, uh, that believed that CPU or general purpose software was the best way to go. And it was the best way to go for a long time. Uh, we felt, however, that there was a class of applications uh, that wouldn't be possible without acceleration. And, uh, or you couldn't make it affordable enough for everybody to enjoy without acceleration. And so we started this accelerator company, this accelerated computing company that solved those problems. In the beginning, there weren't that many applications for it, frankly. And we smartly chose uh, one particular combination that was a home run. It was computer graphics, and we applied it to video games. And that combination turned out to have been a giant industry, and now video games is the largest industry in the world, and the largest entertainment industry in the world. And it drove our technology for three decades, you know, because uh, making video games more and more realistic, uh, making it available to more people, took a long time. And we're still in that journey, and frankly, probably early in that journey. You know, there are now probably you know, over a billion gamers in the world, but there are 8 billion people. Someday, everybody's going to be a gamer, and, and, so it's, and it's going to be the largest, by far, entertainment industry. And so... So it turned out to have been a fantastic technology driver for our company. And we, step-by-step, uh, step, added more and more things that we could do to today, artificial intelligence. Beyond gaming and graphics, yeah. NVIDIA has grown immensely. I think that uh, there's a lot of things people might be surprised to hear are powered by NVIDIA. Can you just give a, a very simple list of some of the use cases and big name customers that people might be surprised to hear are powered by NVIDIA? People would probably be surprised that uh, the most powerful and energy efficient supercomputers in the world that are used for molecular dynamic simulations to climate science research, to material science research, to quantum computing research are powered by NVIDIA. All the way to the other extreme, a whole bunch of robots that are powered by NVIDIA in manufacturing lines, uh, self-driving cars that are powered by NVIDIA, to the Nintendo Switch that I'm very proud of that's powered by NVIDIA. So we're, we're in very powerful systems and we're in very energy efficient systems and probably one of the most uh, talked about systems today are the systems at the Microsoft Azure data centers that are powering ChatGPT and uh, the work that we did with OpenAI uh, in the very beginning uh, to now uh, that powers ChatGPT. And I think those are really quite exciting. I'm going to come back to ChatGPT for sure. Um, but first, I wanted to ask you about betting at all. This mm. is something that you have not shied away from in the 30 years that mm -hmm. since you started the company. It was maybe seven times that you've been reinvented and faced, you know, success or utter failure. Mm -hmm. What is the lesson here? 
Well, we're in a, we're in a really fast moving industry. You know, technology is incredible in the sense that such enormous challenges and problems could be solved by computing on the one hand. Uh, on the other hand, the technology changes. And uh, there are so many great companies in the world and we're pursuing uh, very sim similar aspirations. We wanna solve the world's greatest challenges. And so uh, every now and then, a technology revolution comes along. We were started in the PC revolution. Uh, after that, the internet revolution came and all of a sudden the companies before it, some of them didn't make it to the, to the revolution and some of them, some great, great new companies like Google and others got invented during that time. And then uh, the cloud computing revolution came and then the mobile cloud computing revolution came and now we're talking about the AI revolution. And so each one of these transitions, it's very unlikely that the companies that were great before it are still great after it. And um, uh, there are some companies that have made uh, the ability to, uh, because of their adaptability and agility, uh, reinvented themselves along the way. Uh, we had to reinvent ourselves you know, in each one of those technology revolutions. And um, uh, you, you know, agility is just really, really, really important to, to our companies. And one of the things that I'm really proud about our company is at the core of our company is incredible technology. We have incredible technologists. You know, if you're pioneering one of the most important computing platforms in the world from use for scientific computing to genomics to digital biology all the way to video games, well, you're going to need incredible computer scientists. So on the one hand, uh, we're incredibly technology rich. On the other hand, we're in enormous, you know, we're in a giant sea of technology companies. And so the ability for us to adapt and uh, reinvent ourselves and continue to be relevant in, from one generation to another generation was really important, and I'm very proud of that. It hasn't always been success. Can you talk to me about some of the biggest stumbles that you've had to overcome in the years? Well, you know, every company makes mistakes, and I make a lot of them. And, you know, some of them puts the company in peril, especially in the beginning. Because we were small and, and we we're up against very, very large companies and we're trying to invent this brand new technology. And, you know, when you invent something new, uh, you have to convince customers to use it. You have to convince the ecosystem is the right thing to use. And you've got developers, you know, we're a computing company, so developers matter a lot to us. And so we're trying to invent something new and we're, we're barely, we barely know exactly what we're doing. You know, so when you're doing something that's never been done before, you're not exactly sure what you're doing. And yet, on the other hand, you have these giant companies who would like you not to disrupt the industry. And so, so early on, there, you know, there are product mistakes that we made. Uh, there were um, uh, you know, execution challenges that we had. There were some strategy mistakes that I made. And uh, you know, there, there's just so many of them. And you know, one of the skills of resilience is the ability to forget the past. You know, they, just as coaches tell you, don't worry about the last down, worry about the next down. And so, so I try to make sure that the company remembers our learnings from the mistakes. Most founders would be very satisfied being at the helm of such a huge industry with gaming graphics. What signaled to you and when that it wasn't enough? Well, our ambition was always to be a computing platform company. We selected computer graphics and video games as our first market combination, technology market, product technology and market combination. Um, but we, we always believed that, that um, accelerated computing was going to be impactful for many, many different industries. We uh, uh, expanded from, from video games into design, and today just about every product that's designed or every digital asset or movie or you know, almost anything that's designed in 2D or 3D digitally uh, uses NVIDIA somehow. And then we extended that into uh, scientific computing, into physical simulation, and started with seismic processing as a, a field called inverse physics, to um, uh, particle simulations, molecular dynamic simulations, and, and so on and so forth, and fluids, and you know, just about every field of science we're in today. And so I'm really proud of that. And, and that led us to uh, a much more general purpose uh, type of accelerated computing that we created which then one day uh, artificial intelligence found us. You know, this is one of the things that's really amazing about, about a computing platform. 
you have a vision about what you want to create and for the for for whatever reason um, you differentiate in, in your computing approach and maybe you made it super convenient in the cloud maybe you made it possible for you to keep the computer with you all the time mobile cloud and um, in our case uh, accelerated computing makes it possible for you to solve problems that were impossible before and uh, or much more energy efficient than before and so so there's a, there's a fundamental reason that makes a, com a new computing uh, architecture um, successful. And at some point, the positive feedback system starts to work. You know, you, you, you've reached now a lot of different customers and different applications. We're in every cloud made, made, in, made by every computer company. And then all of a sudden, one day, a new application that wasn't possible before discovers you. You know, first you discover them, and then pretty soon they discover you, and this positive feedback system starts to, to feed on itself. I assume you're talking about the moment with AlexNet and uh, CUDA powering that, and sort of the big bang of AI, if you will. I'm curious how much of that you feel like was luck. I mean, what you're talking about is it finding you, it sounds a bit like luck, and how much of it was foresight? Well, it wasn't foresight. Um, the foresight was accelerated computing. The foresight was was uh, making this architecture exactly the same for everybody. Having the discipline of staying um, true to that platform for generation after generation after generation, believing that eventually our install base would be so large that not only would we have reach, but applications would therefore be enabled by us. New, new entire applications that weren't possible before would discover us. This is the nature of cloud. This was the nature of PC. This was the nature of mobile cloud. And each one of these revolutions and generations of technology, in the beginning, there was some fundamental reason it was successful. And then at some point, it achieves a bit of an escape velocity and it becomes exponential because these applications start to be enabled by you and they come and discover you. And so uh, we made a lot of great decisions. And the great decisions uh, associated with, with the architecture and discipline of the platform and evangelizing it to everybody. And uh, we re reached out to research universities all over the world. And, you know, we just believe that someday something new would happen. The rest of it is, uh, requires some serendipity. But the part that was uh, really wonderful was when we realized that AlexNet is not just some neural network, um, but it's a whole new way of doing software. AlexNet is profound in that way. You know, not only was it a, a giant breakthrough in computer vision, it was also a profoundly new way of doing software. Some people call it software 2.0, where the machine augments the software programmers and the data writes the software. Instead of humans typing in a software program, the data creates the software. That way of using experience or data to cause a software to be able to make future predictions was so profound, and we had the good wisdom to go put the whole company behind it. We saw early on, about a decade or so ago, that this way of doing software could change everything. All of the software that we wanted to write that we didn't know how to write, we can now, be, we can now do. And that was a great decision. And we changed the company from the bottom all the way to the top and sideways. Every chip that we made um, was focused on artificial intelligence. Uh, we um, uh, built a wonderful research organization dedicated to artificial intelligence. Our entire software stack was invented for our AI. And, and then uh, all the things that we did to create large systems and networks, and uh, which then became this thing called an AI supercomputer. And, and I, I remember delivering my very first AI supercomputer. I hand delivered it myself. I delivered it to OpenAI. The world's very first AI supercomputer was de delivered to OpenAI. What yeah. year was that? Well, I guess it's like uh, five, six years ago, I guess, five years ago, yeah. And now here we are and uh, OpenAI has taken the world by storm. Do you think that your products, NVIDIA, is at the very center of this and is the has become the must have products to power this next big step? Well, we're the world's engine for AI. Because of the decisions we made a decade or so ago, and we put so much of our might and expertise into it, we're now in every cloud, we're in every country, in every field of science. 35,000 companies use our AI computers to develop and advance this field. 
giant companies like cloud and internet companies all the way to startups, thousands of startups. They're in all kinds of areas, consumer internet to digital biology to robotics. I'm really happy with the, the, the diffusion of the technology. I'm really pleased with how we've democratized the technology so that anybody can access it. You can't ignore the incredible vision and dedication to the work at OpenAI. From the very first day I saw them, they were dedicated to wanting to do this. And they've been focused on it for five years. And uh, of course, in, in research even longer than that, I'm incredibly proud of the work that they've done. Yeah, really terrific team. Here in Silicon Valley, there's a bunch of CEOs and founders who've started mm -hmm bringing up the A100 and uh, kind of publicly competing with each other about who bought more when and who saw this coming. Uh, it's sort of competing for bragging rights around mm -hmm. the A100. What would you want to say to them? There's more. Come get them. Everybody should win. You know, winners to all. In the past, uh, when you start a company, a software company or technology company, you need a lot of software engineers. It is still true. And you need amazing computer scientists. But today's startups, and there are some amazing startups we're working with right now, where there are 25, 30 people backed up with a large data center of AI supercomputers powered by A100s. If you want to start a startup today, uh, it's you and AI. And you're supercharged by the AI supercomputer and the algorithms that you have inside and all the data that you're going to teach it with. And so it's really quite a transformation in how startups are going to get built in the future. And now we're, we're uh, onto something even larger than that, you know, built on these AI supercomputers, these large language models. It's definitely a watershed event for the AI industry. It feels very much uh, like the iPhone moment when mobile cloud really took off. And all of the environmental conditions feel exactly the same way, and just larger and, and uh, much, much more industries. Right now, generative AI is still extremely expensive to mm -hmm. accomplish. How do you think it'll really take off if only a couple big companies have true access to do it at scale? Well, it turns out it doesn't cost that much. And um, the reason why there are so many CEOs with bragging rights on so many A100s is because it's really quite democratized. We took what otherwise would be a billion dollar data center running CPUs and we shrunk it down into a data center of $100 million. Now, $100 million is, uh, when you put that in the cloud and shared by 100 companies, is almost nothing. If you take a look at how much it costs to design a chip, so if you put that in perspective, it costs us about 2 to $3 billion to design A100. When I hit enter and ask TSMC to help us make it, that email is $100 million. And then... It populates these AI supercomputer data centers. And when you train a large language model, let's say it costs $10 million. So the, a chip, and there are 3,000 chip companies in the world, taping out a chip is like $100 million, $50 million, $30 million, depending on the size, but nothing less than $10 million. And now you could build something like a large language model, like a chat GPT, for something like $10, $20 million. That's really, really affordable. And, and so I think the, uh, the ability for every industry to create their foundation model, there's gonna be a protein foundation model, a chemical foundation model, there'll be a robotics foundation model, there'll be foundation models for, for science, for you know, finance, for all kinds of different applications in different, different industries and different countries. I was just in Sweden and, and uh, uh, the Berzelius, uh, supercomputer there we helped them with. We built an AS supercomputer. It's a Swedish foundation model uh, supercomputer. And, and uh, with just tens of millions of dollars, uh, you can build the most powerful supercomputer in, in, uh, in Sweden. And so these are really, really accessible technologies now. There are always skeptics and people who mm -hmm. are alarmed perhaps by how fast AI is taking off and how powerful it's become mm -hmm. with capabilities like deep fakes, uh, mm -hmm. fake eye contact, for instance, that I've seen mm -hmm. an example of. What do you say to them? Well, the first thing that everybody should do is to take advantage of the technology and to boost their own capability. There's no question that the interest behind ChatGPT has been so great. It is the fastest growing application in the world and it's been used in all kinds of different ways. 
The thing that's really amazing about artificial intelligence is that what, is, what ChatGPT has shown is that it has eliminated the digital and the technology divide. Everyone is a programmer now. Everybody could program a computer. During my generation, the way that you program a computer was started with BASIC, and I learned Fortran, and then you learned C, and then you moved to C++, and, and Java, and now PyTorch, or Python. And, and each one of those languages, there was awk, and you know, th these are really weird languages, and they're hard to learn. In the whole time that we've been making computers more and more capable, the technology became harder and harder to use, and the technology divide arguably has been growing until artificial intelligence. And you hear about cucumber uh, farmers who are teaching a robot how to sort cucumbers. And a high school student did that for his mom. And now 150 million people are programming the computer instead of programming the computer with C or Py Python. You're now programming the computer with anybody's plain language. And you tell this computer what you want to do and this computer goes off and does it. Or you tell the computer you like to write a Python script, and it goes off and does it. And so this capability has democratized computing for the very first time. It's put technology, very powerful technology, in the hands of anybody who would like to use it. And so I think this is, this is really genuinely the first time in my generation that we've created something or contributed to create something that made our technology accessible to everyone. Not just to use but to harness, not just to use, but to program. And so I think every domain expert in the world will be able to do that. And I, I recommend everybody just, number one, take advantage of AI and augment your work, make yourself more productive, lift yourself, you know, power up, power up your own career, power up your own capability. And then from there, um, you know, increase the productivity of society and, and move everything along. How do you stay ahead in an industry where some of your customers could become your competitors? Mm -hmm. to, you know, speaking about Google's TPUs and mm -hmm. Amazon uh, has their own mm -hmm. internal chips as well. How do you stay ahead in mm -hmm. that landscape? We stay ahead by number one, doing it very well, but also we do it very differently. The first thing that I would say is that every data center in the world should accelerate every workload they can. And the reason for that is because, as you know, the world's data centers consume a lot of power now. And it used to be the case that because of Moore's Law, even though we required more computing throughput every year, the amount of power that the world's data centers consume didn't grow that fast. And the reason for that is because of Moore's Law. But now that's changed. That has ended. And as a result, if we want to increase the amount of computing throughput we want, um, and that's, there's no question that's happening, then the amount of power that the world needs in the data center will grow. And you can see in the recent trends, it's growing very quickly. And that's a real issue for the world. The first thing that we should do is every, every data center in the world, however you decide to do it, for the goodness of sustainable computing, accelerate everything you can. Now, an ASIC is designed to be application specific. It does nothing, you know, it does exactly that and it does it very well. What NVIDIA does is a general purpose accelerated computing platform. So we could, on the one hand, simulate climate science, on the other hand, do robotics, on the other hand, do large language models, or computer graphics and play video games and such. And so our ability to be flexible, versatile, and also extremely performant lets us increase the versatility and the utility, the utilization of it inside a data center. When you build an infrastructure, the most important thing for you is utilization. You can't afford to have hotels that are occupied 30%. You would like the, the, the data center even more so because it costs billions of dollars. NVIDIA's accelerated computing platform lets you have versatility and utilization. So our TCO, our cost, is actually the lowest of all. And that's the reason why people use it, because they can use it on so many things. The second reason is we're in every cloud. And so if you're, if you're an enterprise customer or developer or a startup company and you would like to have the ability to operate your service in every cloud or any cloud across the world, we make it possible for you to do it in every cloud, on-prem, uh, hybrid cloud, all the way out to the edge, one architecture. What do you say to gamers who 
wish you had kept focus entirely on the core business of gaming? Well, uh, if not for all of our work in physics simulation, if not for all of our research in artificial intelligence, what we did recently with GeForce RTX would not have been possible. We invented the GPU and programmable shader 25 years ago, a quarter of a century ago. And it's remained basically the same for the last 25 years. About five years ago, we came to the conclusion that in order for us to take computer graphics and video games to the next level, we had to reinvent and disrupt ourselves, change literally what we invented altogether. And so we invented this new way of doing computer graphics, um, ray tracing and um, basically simulating the pathways of light and uh, simulate everything with generative AI. And so we compute one pixel and we imagine with AI the other seven. It's really quite amazing. Imagine a jigsaw puzzle and we gave you one out of eight pieces and somehow the AI filled in the rest. Pretty amazing. And so as a result, we increased the performance of what well, made possible ray tracing. We increased the performance by probably a factor of five. Or another way to think about that, we reduced the amount of energy consumed by a factor of five. And so that, that great invention completely revolutionized video games. In the next 25 years, because of what we did, I think we have 25 years of amazing future. Just a couple questions about the state of the industry. Mm. Um, experts seem to say the worst of the chip shortage is over. How did NVIDIA weather that storm? The chip shortage was a strange one. On the one hand, there was chip shortage. On the other hand, um, about the same time, you know, this is now, we're now coming out of it, but some two or three quarters ago, uh, we had supply challenges and demand challenges at the same time, but not at the same customer, not in the same industry, not in the same market. And so that was very, very challenging to have your you know, foot on the gas and your foot on the brakes at exactly the same time and, you know, full pressure on both. Our company weathered it just fine. We're, we're a strong and resilient company. Our financial performance wasn't as good as our technology and contribution performance. We did some of our best work ever in the history of our company. A100 was replaced by H100, which, which we're in the, you know, full production now. Uh, all the work that we do with AI supercomputing and RTX ray tracing and all of that came out during this time. Meanwhile, our financial performance wasn't very good. And so I think the lesson there is, you know, focus on doing your good work and things will work out for itself. And, and so I'm, I'm really, really pleased with the company and the work that everybody's done. And uh, uh, going forward, I think it's starting to ease up now. I think we're starting to uh, have a lot less inventory in channels and uh, the industry has, has uh, more capacity and more flexibility and uh, we're moving nicely into uh, uh, the next generation nodes. And um, so almost everything is starting to, to get better. Yeah. What about a price slump? Does that worry you? Everything that we build uh, is rather singular. Uh, and the markets that we serve aren't commodity markets. You know, right now, more than any time, the investment needed in AI is just off the charts. Generative AI, this is the moment that we've all been working for uh, in the last 10 years. And, and uh, now AI is about to uh, be used for, to revolutionize digital biology and genomics and transportation and retail and right, all these different industries, search. And you know, so everything about the situation we're in right now is really about growth and, and really about getting into uh, the next phase of computing and AI is at the center of that. So I, I'm super excited about the, the, the moment we're in. I want to make sure that we take advantage of it and capitalize on it. The vast majority of your chips are made by TSMC. Mm. How have you insulated against geopolitical risks of the region in the, in the case that the Silicon Shield doesn't hold? As a company, our first, our first priority is to make sure that we're as, as resilient as possible. And in every, every area that we can, um, to be as, as resilient through diversity and redundancy as much as we can. In semiconductor design tools, uh, the manufacturing of our chips, packaging, memory, systems, the systems that we build, AI supercomputers, these things are like cars. They weigh 350 pounds per computer. They're the heaviest computers that humans make. 
And it's, it's complicated. It's got tens of thousands of unique parts. And so we try to engineer and design into everything that we do, diversity and redundancy. The fact of the matter is TSMC is a really important company. This is a really special company. And the world doesn't have more than one of them. It, it is imperative upon uh, ourselves and them also invest in diversity and redundancy. And, and the move that they made recently in building uh, the fab in Arizona is a very big deal. Will you be moving any of your manufacturing to Arizona? Oh, absolutely. We'll use Arizona. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The thing that's really great about TSMC is uh, every mask runs everywhere. And so they have the ability to, to use, you know, uh, all the various fabs for the masks that we have. And so, so I'm, I'm, ex I'm excited about the, uh, the investments that they're making so that the, the entire world can count on them for diversity and redundancy. Yeah, it's a really special company. About a quarter of your revenue comes from mainland China. How do you calm investor fears over the new export controls? Well, NVIDIA's technology is export control. It's a reflection of the importance of the technology that we make. Uh, the first thing that we have to do is comply with the regulations. It was a, uh, a turbulent you know, month or so as the company went upside down to uh, re-engineer all of our products so that it's compliant with the regulation and yet still be able to serve the commercial customers that we have in China. Uh, we're able to serve our customers in China with the regulated parts and delightfully support them. And so I think, I think we're going to be just fine in the ability to serve the customers there. Uh, the, the customers that we have there are, are uh, consumer companies and consumer internet companies. And, you know, this, the regulation is going to be just fine. We're going to be able to, to work through it. You are famous for reinvention. What's the next one going to be? The next big reinvention is probably where AI meets the physical world. And you know, if you, today, all, all of our AI experiences are related to digital. It's um, in software, it's, a, you know, it's information, it's all digital related um, AI. The next generation of AI and where, where AI meets $100 trillion of the world's industry, that's in the physical world. And so it could be transportation, it could be robotic surgery, it could be um, warehouses and manufacturing plant and energy plants and fabrication plants and so on and so forth. And in order for us to bring digital technology and artificial intelligence technology into that physical world where humans are and safety is important and resilience is important and you know all of, all of those kind of physical world physics related challenges, we need a new type of software and we created this thing called Omniverse that allows us to dig to connect the digital world and the physical world. And uh, Omniverse is going to be a phenomenal, phenomenal success. And we have 700 plus cus customers who are trying it now. And uh, uh, from car industry to uh, logistics warehouse to, um, you know, to wind turbine plants. And so, so I'm really excited about the, the progress there. And it's an, it represents probably the single uh, uh, greatest container of all of NVIDIA's technology, computer graphics, artificial intelligence, robotics, and physics simulation, all into one. I have great hopes for it. This is the last one, just a, mm -hmm. on a personal note. Yeah. You are the longest running tech CEO. Is there any end in sight? Well, as you could tell, I'm sprightly and, and uh, <laughs> quite enthusiastic and energetic yet. Um, I, I, I'm surrounded by amazing people. They uh, keep me inspired and uh, I feel that we could do great things together. They give me so much confidence in the, what we can do and the impact we can make. And uh, I, I feel that I'm, I'm making a real contribution to the company and to them and uh, to, create a, to create an environment where we can make you know, really amazing contributions. And so, so I, I think this is for so long as I, I believe I could do that. And um, uh, I don't know exactly how, that, how long that's going to be, but three or four decades, I would say, you know, in another four decades, I'll be robotic and, you know, maybe another three or four decades after that. And so hopefully, hopefully I'll get to enjoy this for a very long time. Wonderful. Well, thank you for today's conversation. Thank you, Katie. <laughs>